Let's pray together. Lord, we humble our hearts in the presence of the holy and awesome Son of God. Lord, today I pray that by your presence and by your Holy Spirit, you would just open our eyes, minister the peace and the rest that our soul so desperately needs. God, in a world of chaos, a world of confusion and unrest, God, we're grateful that we can look to you today and be at peace. God, thank you for your word, thank you for your presence, and thank you for your people. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Turn to two or three people and say, you're looking good this morning. Christmas time, it is the largest celebration around the world each year. Other holidays have just one day. Christmas is emphasized for the entire month. And doesn't it seem that when we go to the supermarkets and the big box stores and the, the outlets and the malls that they're starting earlier and earlier? Uh, I couldn't believe that they started to put up Christmas trees and decorations for sale. It's amazing. The story of Christmas is God becoming flesh and blood like you and I to redeem us from sin and death. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. This morning I just want to take a few moments to present the Christmas message in the most simplistic and hopefully the most compelling terms. You see, we are living in a day and an age where there is so much confusion and conflict in our world today. There are conflicting voices and confusing philosophies. There are conflicting ideologies and confusing values. But Christmas is the story of God becoming man like us in order to save us from our sins and to bring us to heaven for all eternity. The gospel means, in the original language, simply the good news. So the gospel is good news. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. When the angel announced the birth of Jesus, the angel said, Behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. I have a very simple outline. I have used this outline before, but I purposely did not refer to any of my notes from other sermons, but I prayed and I read the scriptures and I studied and I asked God to give me fresh understanding. How many of you know when you study the word of God last year or last month, when you study it a new day, you're in a new place and the Holy Spirit wants to give you greater understanding in his word? How many of you know that the word of God is so deep and so wide that the wisest and most profound theologian cannot get to the bottom of it? But the word of God is shallow enough so that even a child will not drown in it. The word of God is so awesome that it speaks to our life and it speaks to our thoughts even here today. It's a scary thing to know that God knows our thoughts. Did you ever go into a room and you didn't know anybody was there, and you thought to yourself, did I say anything, or was I just thinking that? That ever happened to you? And, and the scary thing is that God knows every thought that we have. And the Word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. This morning, I thank God for the simple gospel message, the simple Christmas message. 
And I have four points that I'm going to go through, take about a half hour for each point. I knew that would get your attention. Just a few moments. I warn you, those are a preacher's few moments, not re real, literal few moments. Four points. Jesus came. I came for you. And he said, I will leave my place. I will come to your place. I will take your place. And I'll bring you back to my place. Simple but profound. It captures the whole Christmas message. It captures the whole gospel message. Jesus said, I will leave my place. And in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, the Bible tells us, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich. Jesus was rich beyond all comprehension. I'm talking about big news this morning. Isn't it amazing that culture calls big news the release of information of the first the, the, the NFL draft, the first round. Big news, who was taken in the draft. Or big news, the latest features of the new smartphone. Big news. Or big news of the, the, the newest release of a, of a Christmas movie. But I'm talking about big news this morning. God invading planet Earth to bring salvation to mankind. Can you give God a clap of praise this morning? I'm talking about God leaving the glories of heaven, a place of absolute beauty and perfection, holiness, purity, a place where Jesus, as the Son of God, part of the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, was worshipped by holy angels 24-7, a place of, where there are streets that are paved with gold, no potholes, no evil, no sickness, no pain, no sorrow, a place no Hollywood production could even begin to depict, a place where there is no way that even in our greatest and most wildest imagin imagination we could envision. You see, the Christmas story is of God stepping out of eternity into time as a baby in a stable in Bethlehem. We cannot even fathom how high and how holy God is, but yet he stepped down on planet Earth to redeem mankind. About 20 years ago, uh, a pastor friend of mine and another friend, they had a passion for street ministry. They had a passion for inner city ministry. And they wanted to minister to people on the streets. And, and so what they did was, because they wanted to know what it was like to live in the streets, they, for a few days, began to grow their beard and not shave and just become to begin to look kind of scruffy. And what they did was, they left their wallet at home, they left their ID at home, they left their money at home, and they went on the streets, and they decided to stay on the streets overnight in the cold of winter. No place to stay, no money, no food. They did that for the purpose of, of understanding what it was like to live on the streets. They left their comfortable home, comfortable bed, full refrigerator, left all the creature comforts of their home to go live in a shelter overnight. To experience it. And in some small way they gained an understanding. But how small in comparison to what God Almighty left in the glories of heaven to come down to planet earth. Even if Bill Gates or Warren Buffett gave away their billions of dollars and gave it all away, gave their, all their businesses away, all their homes, all their finances, and went to live in the worst of slums on planet Earth, it would still not compare what God left behind to come and live on planet Earth. 
He said, I will leave my place and I'll come to your place. God came down to our level. The Bible says, though he was rich, yet he became poor. Hallelujah. Thank God for the gospel. You see, God came down to our level because we could not get up to his level. Man in his pride, man in his arrogance, in his religiosity, tries to measure up to certain standards and thinks that by, by, by living according to a certain code of ethics that they will somehow, some way impress God. But the Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. Our righteousness is as nothing compared to the holiness of God. So God in his mercy and his grace came down from the glories of heaven to come down to our level. He came to our place. Think about God being born just like you and I as a baby in a manger. Born just like you and I. He grew just like you and I. The Bible says he grew in wisdom and stature. And he was also tempted just like you and I. But thank God the Bible says he was tempted in all ways like as we yet without sin. But because he was tempted, he could relate to you and I when we are tempted. Not only was he born like us, he grew like us, and he was tempted like us, but he suffered like us. The Bible tells us he felt pain, he felt disappointment, he grew tired, he was fatigued, he was lonely. He went through all of that. He came to where we live so that he could relate to you and I. One writer said he was born in the humblest of settings, yet heaven above was filled with the songs of angels. His birthplace was a cattle shed, yet a star brought the rich and noble from thousands of miles to worship him. His birth was contrary to the laws of life, and his death was contrary to the laws of death. Yet no miracle is greater than his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his teachings. He had no cornfields or fisheries, yet he spread a table for 5,000 and had bread and fish to spare. He never stood on expensive carpeting, yet he walked on the waters as they supported him. His crucifixion was the crime of crimes, yet from God's perspective, no less a price could have made possible our redemption. When he died, few mourned his passing, yet God hung a black curtain over the sun. Those who crucified him did not tremble at what they had done, yet the earth shook under them. Sin never touched him. Corruption could not get a hold of his body. The soil that was reddened with his blood could not claim his dust. For over three years he preached the gospel. He wrote no book. He had no headquarters and built no organization. But 2,000 years later, he's the central figure of human history. The perpetual theme of all preaching the pivot around which the ages revolve, the only redeemer of the human race. At this season of celebration and gift giving, let's join the wise men who fell down and worshiped him. Let's remember that he is Christ the Lord. Let us worship him. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. It was his great love who compelled him to come down for you to right where you live. He said, I'll come, I'll leave my place, and I'll come to your place. But ultimately, he came to take our place. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 that he took on himself a form of man, and he submitted himself even to the death of the cross. You see, Jesus didn't stay in a crib in a manger, but he went to the cross, and he did it voluntarily, laying down his life, Why? He he was God. He didn't have to do it. I was reading the Bible this week, and my Bible reading was in Matthew 26, and the scripture told of Jesus how when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they came to arrest him, and Peter, one of his disciples, tried to defend him and took out his sword and cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. And Jesus said, put away your sword. 
said, don't you know that I can call 12 legions of angels to come to my rescue right now? I looked that up. How many uh, would there be in a legion? And I found out there are 6,000 angels in a legion. So if you call 12 legions, that would be what? 72,000 angels. I want to remind you that in the Old Testament, one angel destroyed a city. One angel destroyed a uh, 100,000 plus people in Assyria. One angel, but Jesus said, I could have called six, 12 legions or 72,000. But why? Why? Because he loved us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrated his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Why did he do it? Because of, he came to pay for our sins. He came to take our place. The wages of sin is death. Don't be deceived. Don't be fooled. If you play with the fire, you will get burned. If you sin and live a life of sin, you will have to pay the consequences. You will have to pay the price, and the price is death. You see, he came to take our place. I was reading uh, a few months ago in one of the news apps, and this is a, a true story of where a judge who uh, was judging in a case of one of the the veterans of, of, our, of our military, and the judge was or also a military man. And as he sat in judgment of this man who had committed some uh, small crime, a petty crime, and, and the sentence was a night in jail. So the judge, because he was just, because he had to uphold the law, he had to mete out a sentence of one night in jail. The sentence was handed down and the defendant was sent to, to the jail to, to spend that one night in prison. And what the judge did that, that night, he took off his, royal, his robes as a, as a judge and he himself went into the cell and he spent the night with that man. The news article goes on to say how that man who was sentenced to that one night in jail broke down and wept. Because the judge would come and, and spend the night and keep him company in that jail. You see, a million, billion times over, that's what God did when he came to take my place. Thank you, Jesus. I say in all humility, thank you, God, for taking my place. Thank you, God, for shedding your blood. Thank you, God, for saving a wretch like me. Hallelujah. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. May it never become anything less than a sweet sound in your ear. You see, Jesus died the just for the unjust, that he might be both the just and the justifier of man. You see, anyone can devise a plan by which good people may go to heaven, but only God can devise a plan whereby sinners his enemies can go to hell. He said, I'll leave my place. I'll come to your place and I'll take your place so that I can take you back to my place. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Hallelujah. Thank God for that truth this morning. You know, the reality of it is many times we, we hear of somebody who has a sickness and we say they're, they're terminal. But I want you to know you're all terminal this morning. The last time I checked, 100% of us are terminal, immortal. We will die. I, I heard of someone uh, not too long ago that they were close to 100 years old. They were going to the doctor and they were complaining, doctor, my back, doctor, my arm, doctor, I'm getting pains. And, 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 and the doctor ran all kinds of tests. The doctor, oh, a CAT scan and MRI and blood work and, and, and doctor came back and, 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 and the person with, with, with such anticipation, doctor, what's wrong with me? 
because you've got old age. I don't know about you, but I'll sign a contract right now. I'll take 90, 95. I'll live that long. But the reality of it is no one has a guarantee. No one knows. I, we hear of too many people, young people, don't think that you've got a whole life ahead of you. The gospel is about God care coming to save and redeem mankind. It's about salvation. It's about knowing that you know that you know you have a place in heaven. And everything else pales in comparison to the gospel, the salvation of a person's soul. What shall a man give in exchange for a soul, Jesus said, if you gain the whole world? And you lose your soul. The Bible speaks of a separation. In the last days, one will be in the field and one will be taken. One will be be working and the other, uh, one will be taken and the other will be left at their post. There will be a separation. Not everybody gets to heaven. Jesus said the road that leads to eternal life is narrow. Strive, press in to to be on that road, to get into that gate. Because wide and broad is the road that leads to destruction. You see, there are certain truths that are undeniable. There are certain truths that are inexplicable. There are certain truths that that will be forever emblazoned in the word of God that will not be changed. Number one, mankind is lost. That's why Jesus came. Mankind is lost. We need a savior. If we look at the world today, we want to blame it on politicians. We want to blame it on other people. We want to blame it on everything and everyone except take responsibility and realize mankind is lost. It's a sin problem. Mankind is lost. Eternity is is certain. Eternity is certain. There's no escaping it. We are created to live forever. We have a physical body that will perish, that will die. But we have a spirit that will live on in a true and a real existence for all eternity. And the third truth is Christ is the only answer. He's the only answer. He's the only one who can say, I'll leave my place. I'll come to your place. I'll take your place on the cross and I'll bring you back to my place. Mohammed can't say that. Confucius can't say that. No Hollywood figure can say that. No political leader. Only Jesus. There is no other name. There is no other name given amongst men whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. John chapter 1, and with this I close. John chapter 1, the Bible says that Jesus came unto his own, but his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them he gave the authority or the power to become children of God. Not those who are born of the flesh or of the will of man, but those who are born of Many has received him. He was the gift of God. To as many as received him, to them, he gave the right or the authority to become children of God. Do you know the greatest gift, the most expensive, the most perfect gift, as beautifully as it is wrapped and as as lovingly as it is presented, is of no value unless it's received, unless it's opened. I read an article of a man who had received a gift, and for 49 years, he never opened it. Kids, try waiting 49 minutes. 49 years, he never opened the gift. Wow. As great as the gift was, it did him no value. The same of the truth of the gospel, the same of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the gift of God without accepting it, without receiving it by faith, without living it out by faith. It profits you, it profits me nothing. We must accept it, we must receive it to as many as received him. To them he gave the right to become children of God. Would you stand together with me? A wonderful gift, unopened, is a worthless gift. A wonderful gift left unopened is a worthless gift. 
I want to ask you this morning, if we can just have the keyboard. I want to ask you this morning, have you received the gift of God? Have you accepted and received Jesus Christ? What I'm asking you, while heads are bowed, eyes are closed, while you're just, just thinking and, 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 and letting God speak to you. What I want to ask you this morning is the most important question in all of, of history, in all of the universe. Have you received God's gift in the form of Jesus Christ? Have you neglected it? Have you cast it aside? Has it been presented to you before? Has God dealt with you and you've just put it off and you say, well, when I'm a little older, well, well when my, my career is all set, well, when I get married or this happens or that happens, have you put it off? Have you neglected the gift? Or maybe today this is the day where you make that choice, you make that decision and say, you know what, I'm going to receive the gift of God, which is forgiveness. What a beautiful word, forgiveness. You receive forgiveness. You receive eternal life with Jesus in a place he says, I go to prepare. How awesome is that? How great is that? This Billy Graham told the story about Albert Einstein, who was a great genius, one of the greatest thinkers and the greatest genius of this century and maybe many centuries. He was once traveling from Princeton on a train when the conductor came down the aisle, punching the tickets of every passenger. When he came to Einstein, Einstein reached in his vest pocket, but he couldn't find his ticket, so he reached in his in his pants pocket, it wasn't there. He looked in the briefcase, he couldn't find it. The conductor said, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are. We all know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. Einstein nodded appreciatively. The conductor continued down the aisle, punching the tickets. He was ready to move to the next car. He turned around and he saw the great phys physicist down on his hands and knees, looking under his seat for his ticket. The conductor rushed back and said, Dr. Einstein, Dr. Einstein, don't worry. I know who you are. No problem. You don't need a ticket. I'm sure you bought one. Einstein looked up at him and said, young man, I too, I know who I am. What I don't know is where I'm going. The question I ask you this morning, do you know who you are? And do you know where you're going? If you're born again this morning, if you know Jesus Christ personally, if, you, if you've been forgiven, if you have salvation, if you received the gift, I want you to be praying for someone else this morning. I want you to pray for your loved ones. Please, please, please don't be deceived. Don't be lulled to sleep into thinking that somehow, some way, people could get to heaven on their own by neglecting and rejecting the gospel truth. Don't be deceived and lulled to sleep by culture and society and thinking that, you know, well, maybe, maybe somehow, some way, it's going to all work out in the end. Yes, God already worked it all out. He did it already. The question is, what will you do with Jesus? What will you do with that gift? While heads are bowed, eyes are closed, I just want to ask you just very simply, just very quickly, if you, if you have never fully accepted Jesus, only you know don't worry about anybody else right now. Don't worry about what they're thinking. The important thing is, have you accepted that gift? Have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you repented of your sins? Have you asked Jesus to come into your heart, take control of your life? While heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you, you say, Pastor, I need to receive the gift. I need to receive Jesus. Just quickly, lift your hand right now all over this place. Just lift your hand. God bless you. 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 Anyone else? Just raise your hand and say, I need, I need Jesus. I receive him. I believe in him. I accept the gospel this morning. I accept God's grace. You can put your hand down. God bless you. Anyone else? If you're not sure, this is not something that you just put off. No one is guaranteed a tomorrow. The Bible says today's the day of salvation. Now's the time. The best time to respond to the gospel is the first time. 
Each succeeding time, it becomes a little more difficult. Your heart can become a little more hardened. Please, I, I plead with you, God bless you. Receive the gift of God. Receive the love of God this morning. Pray for your family. Pray for your relatives that are lost, that are on their way to hell without Jesus, that will spend eternity separated from the presence of God because they, they trample on the blood of Jesus. They trample on the gospel message. Pray for them today. Pray for your own soul. If you need a new life, if you're empty this morning, if you're broken, if you're disillusioned and disappointed, if you've tried to find pleasure in so many different things, I want you to understand only in Jesus is there fulfillment. While heads are bowed, eyes are closed, would you just raise your hand one more time? I want to pray for you. I want you to pray after me. Dear God, I acknowledge that I need you. God, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I received the gift of God this morning. I received salvation. I receive forgiveness. I receive a new life. God, I pray you would change my life today. God, you know what I'm going through. You know what I'm thinking. You know where I'm at. God, I pray that you would reveal your love to me today. I ask you to forgive me. I accept you into my life. I put my faith in you. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to give me grace. And I believe that I am your child today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you all lift your hand today together with me as I pray. Father, thank you for everybody under the uh, listening to the word of God and hearing the Bible today, hearing the truth of God. I pray for the children. I pray for the older folks. I pray for everyone today that the word of God would become alive in their hearts and their lives. I pray that the truth of God would once again make an impact in their life and in those that they minister to, their family members. God, I pray, oh Lord, that people's hearts would be softened to the gospel. God, soften the hearts of brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews and relatives. Soften their heart to receive the love of God. Break through the blindness, break through the excuses and break down the walls, the barriers and reveal your love to all people. God, I thank you for each and every one that has received the gift of salvation that knows you personally. Bless their lives, bless their Christmas with the joy and the peace of Christ. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, God bless you. God bless you. Merry Christmas.